today I would like to talk um, about how the robots are perceiving the physical world. Um, at the beginning, I would say, a little bit spoiled, not yet, fully, uh, but we are doing that. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, so, the outline of the presentation, I will start with the shortly describing our team, then I will give the introduction, then I will talk about predicting bending angle of elastic rods for robotic manipulation, then about terrain classification, and the formation of object surfaces, and how we are doing this, and then short conclusions in the end. Okay, so the team, to, to make you familiar with what we are doing in Poznan, um, in terms of division of control and robotics, we've got 29 members, eight PhD students. We've got a lot of uh, collaborations around the world, also like South America, uh, Australia, so we, we are doing the research with our uh, groups around the world. Uh, what we are mainly doing uh, in terms of our groups, we do autonomous mobile robots uh, to do this, uh, we need SLAM, so we've got quite strong SLAM group. And we also work on aerial robots using all these things that we develop here. And also we have computer vision group, but they are mostly focused on embedded system and this distributed visual monitoring system. And what we do here is machine learning, which is also related to computer vision. And then we've got also a group on human machine interfaces and control engineering, pure control engineering, because we are still also a control engineering group. Um, we've got four ongoing projects right now. Um, two of them on manipulation, founded by NCBR, and then we've got Horizon 2020 project, and also the project we, we, in collaboration with Solaris Bus and Coaches. We work on the support system for the drivers. Um, I will focus on those two projects, so all the results are from those two projects. So, a couple of words for sponsors. Uh, first project is from Anello, is about elastic object manipulation. It is funded by National Center of Research and Development. Uh, and we are focused on controlling and perceiving the, perceiving the elastic objects and controlling the robot to perform the manipulation of such things. And in the next uh, uh, of our project, this is Subterranean Haptic Investigator. In short, this is Thing. Uh, we are aiming at uh, working on novel food design. This is done by University of Pisa. Then we work on improved perceptual capabilities. Um, what we mean, because we want to enrich existing modalities in terms of lay, LiDAR and vision with haptic information. So you can imagine if you turn off vision, for example, it's totally dark, or there is like humid dust and everything, you cannot rely, for example, on LiDAR, you can, do still, you can still touch the walls, touch the ground. Um, so this is our aim in this project. Uh, so we wa also want to have this height and physical sense of the environment, so we want to know the friction, uh, ground stabilities, etc. And through all this, we want to achieve enhanced mobility through improved perception, prediction, and uh, control, which is based on this perception. Uh, so our partners in this project is University of Oxford, working with us on perception, ETH Zurich, uh, which is providing also the platform and their startup, uh, and Ebotics, and we've got QB Robotics from Pisa as well, and to end user, which is municipality of Zurich, so we're gonna go underground uh, in the sewers inspection, and also we engage KGHM, so Polish mining company, so our robot will be also tested underground in the mine, like one kilometer beneath the ground. Okay, um, so the introduction to the topic, so we skip this administrative stuff. Uh, so now the introduction. Um, so why the robot needs understanding of the physical world around it? Um, most of the um, systems which are working on the robots are working with the geometry. So we've got vision, we can see that this is a such shape, but we want to also have some understanding what is the physics behind it. For example, if I've got a sense of touch, I can feel whether it is soft or hard, whether it is like something like a spring, which is giving the force back, or is it deforming like plastic, it's got plasticity. I want to know that um, because I do physical interactions. So the robots are not agents which are like something like a ghost. They are interacting with the environment they are in. Um, so we also want to predict the outcomes of its actions. So if I touch something, if I feel that I'm touching this object, I can predict what will gonna happen with this object. For example, if it's, if it's got plasticity, I will deform it after touching it. And why we want to do this? Because we want to have better manipulation. So this perception of the physics of the world is really used for, uh, for manipulation. So when I'm grasping, touching, squeezing the object. And also on the same side, you can also think about walking. When you walk, for example, up the hill 
and the hill is paved. It's a road, you just walk. But if the same, exactly the same shape is, for example, made of sand, you're going to walk totally differently. So from leader or from camera, you're going to think, OK, this is a slope with angle, I don't know, 30 degrees, and I'm going to walk. But if you start walking on the sand, you start like sliding, anything like that. So we want to know that, how to cope with that. Um, and how we do this? So we use mainly force torque sensing. So we are touching and checking the forces, in interaction forces. So we have to interact with the environment. It is also related to, to the works which is done by Carol Hausmann, which had uh, uh, yesterday his talk. He's also like doing this interactive perception. So you interact to perceive. Um, and what we do, we also use RGB and depth data registration. And having all this data, we need to build some kind of model of the world around us. So we think that neural networks will be a cool thing to do that. Um, I would also like to talk about the scenario. So you can imagine that, for example, I'm touching the objects around me. For example, I'm going to my um, kitchen and trying to, to wash the dishes. So I'm taking a sponge. And I exactly know that if I'm going to touch it, it's going, I can squeeze it. I'll be really, really astonished it's gonna, if it's going to be hard. So we, what we want to do, we want to use this force torque sensing together with vision and depth, but at some point we want to turn off touching. So before even touching, we want to predict from vision that this object is going to behave like that. So this is our like, ultimate goal. Because we also, we, in our mind, we've got models of those interactions and how the objects are behaving in terms of physics. OK, um, and the application areas. Uh, if we look at the European Union, um, they think about four major technologies that so like uh, applications. They want to have robots in healthcare, so we are interacting with human, which are not solid, they are soft. So if you want to touch human, you, you want to have this physical understanding how, the, how people are built. Agriculture, so if you want to touch uh, weeds or if you want to touch some kind of flowers, anything like that, you need to know how, to behave, how they are going be to behave. If you've got maintenance inspection, most of the time robots are in very harsh conditions. For example, in our case, you can imagine that you are in the mine. There are rocks, stones, sand, everything. So we want to walk in this type of environment, so you need this physical perception. And agile manufacturing, so whatever comes to your robot, and you want to manipulate it, you have to be able to do this. So I think this physical, like perception of this physical world is crucial for also all those four applications. OK, so I'm going to cover three topics. Um, first one is so from the most mature to the less mature. So one is published, one is submitted, one is waiting for submission. Uh, so this is the order. So first one is predicting bending angle of elastic rods. So this is uh, work done with Piotr Kitski, Michał Bednarek, and me. And it was publi published, and um, it's already uh, presented also at Humanoids 2018. Um, so the task is, in, in our world, we've got uh, many deformable and elongated objects. Elongated, they are also, most of the time they are elongated because there's, it is easier to grasp them if they are elongated, uh, if you want to manipulate them. But we want to want to have this perception how they're going to behave when we touch them or squeeze them or bend them. So we want to, robots to be able to grasp and manipulate such objects. And we want to provide the system uh, based on deep neural network that can predict the bend angle of such objects using single RGB image only. So no depth, just RGB image. OK, um, so we did training on synthetic data. If we want to make it robust when we switch, uh, so we, we do the transfer to real life, we did all this training on synthetic images from, so from ImageNet. So we, um, in 3D environment, we provided uh, different types of rods, elastic rods with different orientations, different bending angle. So, and they were then uh, overlaid on those images. So we've got background, not just black background, but background which is uh, closer to reality. So we had ground truth for them, so we are able to do the learning process. And so we, what we propose is encoder decoder neural network architecture, uh, but with interpretable latent vector. 
So we are able um, to have an element which is describing measurable physical bending angle. Uh, I will show it later in the next slide. So our system was trained on synthetic data, uh, but also was able to perform well on real data. And this architecture also allows us to hallucinate how the deformable pipe or, or rod uh, with initial bend would look like when we subject it to the arbitrary bend angle. So I can predict how it's going to behave. Um, so how it was done, we had, we, so our colleague Piotr called it Bender Network. Um, so what we do, we've got encoder, we've got decoder, so classical, and then we've got, on this representation, we've got additional transformation, which you can have here. So we just take one of the parameters, which is here in this space, and train the model. So this is exactly representing the angle of bending angle. So we are training to get physical understanding of the angle that we have in the image, but with the interpretable uh, variable which is hidden here. Okay, but so this is the Bender network, but we, as you remember, we had the background. So to deal with the background, we used uh, another network which was doing the mass generation for us. So we had like two networks for two tasks. One is to subtract the background, so, so to get clear um, clear object, and then perform this bending network, which is providing us measurable bending angle. And if we look at the results, we get synthetic data, two data sets here, and real data, and we did different uh, slices of this data. So we are performing quite well on the synthetic data set. For the first one, it's really, really good. Uh, but this one was tougher. And when we transform it to real data, this is not that bad, so this is mean average error in radians. So uh, the average error was around something around, I think it was less than 10, uh, 10 degrees in the real data set. When we transformed this just purely without uh, much doing with real data because we don't have much real data. Um, so this is what we did in terms of results. And I also, so, um, I also want to uh, emphasize that we can take arbitrary, um, so the, the rod with arbitrary angle, bending angle, and then tell, tell the system, for example, tell me how it's going to look like if I bend it like 20 degrees more, and I can hallucinate it. So this was like one of the nice things that we could get. Really. Okay, um, so the next uh, slide would be on terrain classification. And what we did here, um, um, we, we did this research together with our colleagues from ETH Zurich. So the group here was Jakub and Michał uh, from our team from Poznań, and Lawrence and Marco from ETH. And our paper is submitted to ICRA. It is, what am I touching? It's learning to classify terrain via, via haptic sensing. And what we are doing here, we are doing terrain classification method, and it is based on raw readings from the FT sensor. So we've got four stroke sensing in the feed, so we can measure the interaction force and, um, and torques when we touch the ground. So we've got a lot of signals from there. And we use recurrent neural networks. And in our approach, we are using convolutional neural networks. And I will talk, uh, talk about it later. Um, so what we do, we do the classification of the terrain type uh, for different walking speeds and directions. Because so we didn't want to have this such controlled environment, so we've got constant speed and the robot is just walking. So we focus also about giving different directions, giving different speeds. And we also afterwards uh, provided a clustering technique, which allows the robot to recognize differences between terrains without imposing human knowledge. Because the problem here is with this physics, um, if we give the categorical data, so if I tell, okay, this is a sand, this is uh, grass, this is asphalt, this is also sand, but this is our imagination. This is, it is somehow related to the physical properties of those materials, but not that much. So we wanted to find groupings uh, in unsupervised manner, because it might happen that the classes that we think they are distinct, in terms of physics, they might be almost the same class. So this is what we wanted to achieve here. So find the similarities in the data, not in our semantics that we have in our, in our world. What I mean through that is you can imagine once more that we've got sand. And you are walking on a beach, so it's close to the seaside. When you walk 
far away from water, you, it is like really like dry, so you just sink in this sand. If you are closer to the water, you've got more and more moisture, it's becoming harder and harder, and in the end it's almost like, a, like concrete. So even though you name the class sand, its properties are changing uh, through humidity, for example. Our case, which also was mentioned by one of my colleagues, is the temperature. Temperature is also influencing uh, your perception in terms of physics. Uh, where? Water. One day, you are walking, and this is a water, and this is, let's assume this is shallow water, so we can walk through it. So we just go. And today, we've got freezing, and this, the same water, the same spot, the same place, going to be hard because it's ice. So it almost looks similar because it's shiny. Because if, if we assume that this, is, this, this ice is quite nice, so it's going to be close in terms of visual, uh, visual, visual appearance to the water, but its physical property is going to be totally different. So you ha we have to think about, about perceiving the physical world also in terms of what is around us and what are the envi environment variables around us. So these are like quite challenging things that are coming into mind. Okay, um, so we did the um, research on two robots. Um, this, the, the robot on the left side is from ETH Zurich. Uh, it's called Animal, and this is one of the robots that we built ourselves at Poznan University of Technology. This is second version of our robot. We've got now, uh, so this is second generation, and we've got now third generation. So we're building them from scratch in our lab. So I was one of the co-authors of the robot with my colleague Dominique Belter. We started building walking machines when we were, so this was our master thesis project, and this is what made us stay at the university, so we followed with these walking machines. And in the end, we, we managed to get to the point where we are um, working with uh, labs around the world. And I think soon, so it should be January, we're going to have this machine also, because in, in our um, EU grant, we are going to have this uh, robot from Zurich in our lab working on it. So if you are um, willing to see this robot, we're also going to share videos. But if you're willing to come to Poznań to see this cool four-legged robot walking dynamically, jumping and running, so you are welcome. Um, OK, so these are the robots. Um, we had different terrain types, for example, sand, rubber, concrete floor, artificial grass, chipping, uh, and gravel in here. So they are, this is loose, con so um, stiff, um, and for example, rubbery surfaces, so different surfaces. And in case of this ETH robot, uh, they had similar terrains, but walking outdoors. In our case, we do this in laboratory. So we totally had two data sets with two different robots and showed that our method is working on both robots and both uh, data sets. And um, in their case, they had the simplified uh, version of, of the data because each step was of the same length and they were only walking forward and backward. And our robot was, was walking with five different speeds and in three different directions. So we work so straight lines, so forward and backward, and then we also were, were rotating, so the, um, then forces on the contact uh, are different, and also we are walking sideways. So we've got a lot of uh, different length of, uh, of signals. Okay, and this, these are the, the, the um, types of terrain that we have. And first of the method that we proposed is based on LSTM. So we had forward and backward pass, and we stuck a couple of those together. And it was quite fast in learning and working pretty well, as you're going to see in the results section. Um, and so then we've got uh, input sequence and concatenation, and there, there you can also see this forward and backward pass in here. Um, so this is one of the approaches. And the next approach uh, was with, uh, um, was with uh, convolution. We had one deconvolution. You may ask here what this input means. So, so this is 70. So 70 is, was the length of the signal. Uh, which we get from this uh, ETH data set. So this is length of one step in terms of how many uh, samples we had. So it was 70 samples per step. And six, six is a uh, six-dimensional vector that we have for each 
sample because we've got three um, components of force, so force in x, y, and z direction, and we had three components for torque, also around x, y, and z axis. So this is why we have 70 by 6. So then we do the 1D convolution, uh, we do concatenation with max pooling, uh, we've got residual block, and then we get, so full, through fully connected layers, we got to classes. Um, so this is the point when I was, for example, in this case, when I was saying that um, the robots are not perceiving the world, physical world yet, because we are in the categorical data, we've got classes, not directly parameters. So this is one of the uh, things that we have to um, this, uh, elaborate more. And the things that we want to do first, we want to do some kind of smooth transitions between the classes. So for example, Gaussian processes. So we can tell that this terrain is more like sand, but a little bit like a grass. So we want to not, not want to be like crisp, but we're like more fuzzy. So the, we're going to get um, add more layer on top of that. And then afterwards, we want to learn do the regression task, not classification task in the end. But this is quite challenging when you do regression. Uh, in this setting. And in terms of results, uh, so we work on this uh, RNN in, with this data from ETH, which got fixed length. As you can see, we are almost, I think, 95% in here in accuracy. But here is a problem, because if we use RNN, so this recurrent neural network, it was not coping well with data of different length. So because our data set, so from PUT, a different uh, number of samples for each step because we were walking with different speeds, different directions. So as you can see, the performance is really, really poor. It's almost like guessing, no, no information. So we thought about different um, approach. So we couldn't do this using purely um, just raw signals. So we have to resort to using FFT. So we just performed plain and as easy as possible um, FFT transformation. And on top of those vectors of FFT, we performed uh, CNN. So this is what we call so FCNN. So it is CN, C, FCN. Uh, so it's with uh, FFT transform before, done before. So with some pre-processing. And the results are quite good. It's around 80%. Why I'm telling quite good? Because um, previous approaches, are from, I think, two, three years ago, and they were using SVM. So we used the same data, um, the same uh, representation. So we use FFT, and just only through using uh, networks, we had this performance boost from, so this is from here to here, so it's more like 15%. So it was worth doing it that way. Okay. Um, we also did that clustering. So this is what I meant, that we wanted to know what is really in the data without imposing our knowledge. Um, so what we did is also we have this input here. So it is encoder-decoder network. And in here, and in this latent space, we do the centroids. So we learn the, the clustering. But as my colleague, this is the idea from Jakub. Uh, we also discussed this in the morning. Uh, we do this, we not only do the centroids as the like post-processing, so after we have representation, but we also adjusting the representation for this clustering. So we do it in one batch. So, so we do this uh, inside learning process. So we allow the gradient to help us with find the, finding the clusters. So, this is the, so the centroids are not like on top afterwards when we've got present represent, like ready representation, but we're also influencing the representation to help us in this clustering process. Okay, um, so we need a short movie here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oops. Mm -hmm. Sorry. 
as usual, it was working well before. Um, sorry, I will maybe try another way. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Mm, okay. So then I will have to. Uh, um, so I have to resort to describing the process. So we had a um, clustering process, which was doing really well. Um, but something was not working. And because we, we used KME, so we have to set the, the number of uh, classes that we expect to be there. And we had a number of classes that, that were there, so it was six terrain types. And we put the six, and it was not working well. And something went wrong when we were discussing why. And it turned out that our clustering process also found out that there are four different legs in the robot, and each of them is behaving differently. So, so the system first clustered the legs, which were providing the signal. So we were now able to tell from which leg the signal is coming from. And afterwards, when we, on this, imposed that there are six additional classes, the system found that there are those classes for each leg separately. So it was quite funny because we were so also discussing this with Jakub. We were confused. Why this is not working? There are six classes and this is no, there is no clustering. This is not happening. The, the clusters are like spread out and it was not working. And then he asked me, look, this robot's got four legs. And then we like set four classes. So, it, the, robot, uh, so the clustering algorithm found that there are four, four legs. And then we were able to find the classes of terrains inside those legs. So this was quite a uh, challenging and intriguing fact. Um, but we finally managed to deal with that. OK, um, so I think I'll be able to go back to my presentation. Yes. Um, and the last um, part of my talk is about um, 3D reconstruction of non-rigid shapes. Maybe some of you might have chance yesterday um, to see the poster of my other colleague, Michal, who was presenting this. Um, we are struggling with this, like, I think, a year and a half, uh, trying to squeeze as much as possible from deep neural networks and different representation. So what we want? We want to model 3D deformable objects, but once more, using only RGB. So we've got RGB image of the deformable object, and you want to have 3D representation of this deformation. Um, and we, why we do this? Because we want to predict the outcomes of interaction with the object while manipulating it. You can imagine you can have some kind of, I don't know, T-shirt, and you want to grasp it with one hand, and then grasp it with another hand, and for example, fold it. So we want to be able to tell what's going to happen with this fabric when you move it here or there, how it's going to bend. OK, um, so we also registered data from 3D Engine. Uh, so we have performed uh, data acquisition uh, machine, I may, I may say. So um, all those materials were attached into points, and then we were blowing the wind through the scene, and it was just waving, and we got a lot of data. To make it more real, we put different types of textures on it. And to make it even harder, we put some objects in it. Uh, so we've got occlusions. So you have to imagine part of the object which is occluded as well. So this is the data set. And I think it's got a couple of thousands of images, of course, with ground proof. Because if we've got this 3D data, uh, ground proof is given, which is very nice. And what we have in this process, we've got two strands. Um, because we do things in 2D, this is this part, and we do the depth estimation. So we are first, we are <coughs> um, want to get a heat map. Um, the heat map is telling us where the points on the surface of the object would like to be. So, um, like going through whole learning process, we know that. The, um, physics is imposing on us that the points are not moving farther than possible, because then we just break the, the material. 
So there are some positions and the possible movements of the points on the surface which are possible and we want to learn that. So this is this part. And then we also, if we are just in, because here we've got just 2D image, um, we do the depth estimation and we do this in parallel. So we got this feature extractor and it's called for depth estimation, but also this depth estimation got regularization through this heat map which is telling, okay, if you move this point in depth in here, it's gonna break everything. You will break this material. So this is how we do this. And so you start with this input data, color, image of the formed object. You got those occlusions. You put it everything inside our network, and then what you get is reconstructed 3D mesh, uh, in which got physical meaning, and is in a Euclidean space. Okay, and we compare our approach with this paper from CVPR 2018. Um, this is, I think, the closest possible to what we did. Um, so far, we weren't able to get the ground truth data from the authors, uh, so we tested their so we also had to replicate their approach because the code is all not also not available. So um, what we did, we did the comparison of our data set uh, with our <coughs> replication of their code, of their method, what we get from the paper. And as you can see, um, this is mean reconstruction error. And as you can see here, um, we are doing exactly the same as they do in y direction. Um, they, we are a little bit worse than they, than they in x direction, but what is very crucial, uh, their system is not performing well in terms of depth. So they are predicting well in the image plane where the points should be, but their system is not predicting very well how the points are, even they are closer or farther away from you. This is quite hard to obtain because you've got to the image and do the projection geometry to get the real 3D is quite a hard problem. And this is what we addressed here and, and we are doing better than the system which was presented at CVPR 2018 and still adding additional uh, mm, um, yeah, like we are still uh, developing our loss function to do it even better. Okay, um, so this is results. Um, and now, slowly, we are coming to conclusions. Um, so what we are doing, we are prediction, predicting the formation of the objects from R RGB images. So they were, these were either rods or surfaces of the objects. Um, we did successful domain adaptation, so we moved from um, simulated data to real data. Um, I would li also like to mention two things here. Um, in our bending process, uh, we were able also to predict um, bending angle uh, of the objects which are rotated um, like off-plane rotation. So they were rotated um, um, not in the image plane, but in this other plane. So you, you're not, you are not seeing the whole, for example, the whole um, banded pipe because it's like occluded by itself. So you also like so this is why the score was not so um, impressing, maybe, because we had this 10 degrees. But still, if you think that you only see part of the object because it is rotated away from you, it's really, I think it's really good. Um, and we, in, in our approach with this walking machines, we, we get some knowledge of terrain type. Why this is crucial? Because the other part of our group is doing control, and they need parameters of the ground that they are walking on, so they can do more, do more uh, aggressive maneuvers. And the, the thing that we are going to explore more is this interesting terrain clustering, so we, we have to deep, deep, uh, deeper into it, dive deeper into it. And as a future work, we want to do this binding deformation with material elasticity, because now we have um, this Mm, change of, of, uh, of the objects in the Euclidean space, so we can measure it, but we also want to attach how elastic the object is. So what does it mean that the part of this object moves like 10 millimeters? Do I have to attach, if it's really rigid, to move something like 10 millimeters means that I have to apply, for example, 100 newtons, and if, for example, if it's a sponge, 
I need to just apply 10 newtons, so I want to know that. So we want to also attach uh, material elasticity to the, to the knowledge of the material. Um, and then the other thing is this vision haptics integration. So this is what I was talking in at the beginning, that I want to, from vision, predict how the object's going to behave when I touch it. And also work on this unsupervised learning for terrain properties. And this is going to be our next topic in the EU grant that we are doing. So thank you for your attention. It was my pleasure to talk to you. <laughs>